Perfect. Okay. okay, thank you very much all to be here with us today in this seminar where Javi will explain a, a presentation around quantum algorithms for approximate function loading. I think it is a very interesting fact because when we are trying to develop quantum algorithms, we need to always load uh, an initial state that is not an easy matter right now. And I think Javi will will give us a better understanding on that. Well, Javi, just really appreciate your, your input here. I really appreciate to be here uh, because you are an awesome researcher and everybody knows that. And yes, uh, just one more thing, Canis, please, uh, for the rest of the people in this session, if you have any question, please type this in the chat. And then at the end of the, of the, of the, of the session, of the webinar, uh, I will ask, all of the questions to Javi and he will answer them and then we may have a better discussion, but do not interrupt him please and chat, type this in the chat. And with that all said, thank you very much Javi to be here and that's all of yours, thank you. Okay, thank you very much Alberto. So first of all, let me introduce you a, a brief upload of uh, the topics that we are going to, to see today. So first, I'm going to briefly introduce um, myself and my context uh, with my startup and my, my new group, the Enquire group, just to let you know that uh, we are now inquiring instead of QTs, which is the old group. And in case that you are interested in coming or have any uh, touch with, with us, uh, we are open to, to, to discussions and, and to receive new students in case that uh, both parts are interested. So let me go through this uh, introduction of myself. Uh, so my, my personal experience in quantum computing, I'm going to be brief. Uh, my, my experience began when I was studying quantum physics too in the University Complutense of Madrid. And I, I did my, my master uh, this is with, with Dr. Eric Torrontegui from, from TESIC, uh, also in Madrid. And I have also been part of Accenture as a junior analyst will, while doing my master thesis. And I have uh, several points of, of contact with, with, my, with my professional career with, with quantum computing. So finally, I decided to take a PhD. So first of all, where I'm taking my PhD, it is the Inquired Group. So I invite you to visit our website that you have written here. Um, we are basically um, studying all the possible fields in, in quantum technologies, not only quantum computing, also quantum sensing and quantum control um, protocols, quantum optics. So I'm going to introduce you the group briefly because um, we are <coughs> based here in, in Bilbao, and we are the split into three uh, groups. We have the group led by Mikkel Sand, uh, which is oriented towards quantum computing and architectures. We have the group led by Dr. Jorge Casanova, uh, who is doing quantum sensing staffs with MB centers and so. And we also have the group of quantum optics and quantum control led by Professor Sitchen who is especially orientated towards shortcuts to the, to the adiabaticity. And we are also collaborating with uh, 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 PhDs as uh, Angel Rodriguez Rozas, who is uh, from Santander Bank, and as well as we have collaboration with uh, other startups as the, uh, I, the, the hardware startup IQM, based in, in, in who has uh, our collaboration towards the the, the Munich community. So we are also involved in several European projects uh, that are in all the possible uh, quantum technologies. So I really invite you to get in touch with, with us. So we are to get in, in the respect regarding the quantum computing field, we are investigating, we are researching in the adiabatic field with uh, proposing with proposals that um, are concerning cryptography, logistic networks, as well as finance and, and forecasting. And we are also uh, working in the, the digital computational paradigm with quantum field theory, finance, um, 
financial proposals as well as quantum machine learning, which is uh, the, the the topic of today. You no, know, the the, the uh, loading process into quantum computers of classical data. So this is an overview of our latest publications, and, and as a PhD, uh, I have been a speaker in, in many different places as well as the International Congress. My participation is focused on the Open Supercube uh, project, which is the one that aims to build the first quantum computer in Europe and is taking uh, many participants. Uh, and in Spain, only Bilbao is uh, participating in this project. And I have also participated uh, in many challenges as they proposed by IBM as well as So just to briefly introduce the second part of my career, which is my, my startup, Quantum Mats, I'm the CEO. We have uh, collaborations with many important uh, enterprises, uh, hardware providers. Uh, just to make it clear, we are not Mats. Uh, we came from a, a hackathon that took place in Bilbao in 2019, December 2019, just before the pandemic uh, began. And Mats stands for market artificial data series because we solve one of the challenges was it was uh, to solve to generate uh, financial data with a quantum Boltzmann machine actually we did it with a ball machine and um, this is us uh, this is the team uh, just to 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 let uh, you to, to to get in touch with with any of us uh, you are free to to write us and and also to, to participate with, with discussions or whatever. And we have expertise in, in many different areas. I'm not going to, to be heavy with this, but we know about quantum PCAs, quantum decision trees, uh, financial topics, and also the information loading. And we are developing products regarding uh, arbitrage in cryptocurrencies, portfolio allocation, and market artificial data series. So, that's it's a brief introduction. Just if you are curious, if you have any interest, please get in touch either with uh, my my research group, inquire, or with my startup, and we would be pleasure to answer any doubt concerning your professional uh, career and your future. If you want to take a PhD in the academia, or if you want to uh, start in the in the industry uh, <clears throat> with with a startup or, or whatever. So let's go with uh, the topic of today. So we are talking about quantum computing algorithm in the NISC era. And as Alberto has said, one of the most remarkable points here is the loading of information that usually is not considered uh, in the importance that's, that, that it deserves. So uh, I'm going to talk about two algorithms for approximate function loading. So you have the, the publication in, in archive. Uh, it is a jointly work together with a master's student that is already an MC, uh, Gabriel Sanchez Marin, and also with Mikel Sant, who is my PhD director, supervisor. So let me go through the NISC era. So first of all, I'm going to give you a state of the art of classical uh, algorithms and the importance of loading classical data into quantum computers. And then we are going to see the first algorithm, which um, simplifies, was considering to simplify the Grover and Rudolph complexity. I don't know if you already know about this uh, this manuscript that was written in 2002. Uh, and then we have a second algorithm, which is a Taylor variational algorithm. Um, and then I'm giving you some outlook and conclusions. So conclusions. So. Let me go first through the importance of quantum computers in the NISC era. So first, quantum computers are not able to speed up any problem. So only some algorithms will leverage the quantum effects and will have an advantage, an exponential speed up or a quadratic speed up or whatever. So. Uh, first of all, not every problem can be speed up by quantum computing, and the problem itself on knowing which can be a speed up or not, it's uh, really an NPR problem. And everything that is computable with a quantum computer, it is computable with a classical computer. It's basically Turing theory. Uh, 
and the difference it is the time and resources that it may take. So just to make it clear that the, the speed up in terms of uh, mathematical uh, statements, mathematical statement, it is something that the researchers, we aim at uh, finding this kind of speed ups. Uh, I mean, uh, reducing the complexity from an exponential uh, demanding in terms of number of gates to a polynomial one. But actually in the industry, it is desirable, but not necessary. I mean, if you are able to do it two times faster than your competitor, you will destroy the market. So it is sometimes desirable in the theoretical stage. So a factor, it is enough to break the market. And also sometimes the, the energy consumption of a quantum computer related with the energy consumption of a classical computer, of a high performance computer, uh, makes that uh, makes it worth to compute your problem into a quantum computer instead of a classical computer, despite you don't have such a complexity advantage. And eventually, um, we have to be positive and think that maybe for some problems whose data is going to be directly obtained from uh, quantum devices, the data loading is go not going to mean a, is not going to mean a problem because the data is going to be quantum itself. So we have the problem of loading classical data and retrieve a classical answer. So in this way, I'm going to present you the more popular model, which is the input process output model it was proposed in 2019. And basically we have to load the information into a quantum computer, then we apply a certain algorithm and then we have to retrieve the information. So let me remark that in this case, the complexity corresponds to the number of non-parallel entangling, obviously, uh, gates in terms of the number of qubits. And also that this complexity corresponds to the worst part. And as in a quantum computer, we have to perform the loading state every step that we want to run the algorithm, we have to deeply consider the importance of information loading because if we want to run our algorithm several times, we will include this complexity into this runs. So just uh, to mention that Sometimes we have algorithms that have no an intrinsic advantage if we want to retrieve all the information, but when used as a quantum subroutine, it can be efficient. For instance, the quantum Fourier transfer. When we do not want to retrieve the whole information and code in the quantum Fourier transfer, but use it an, as an ancillary process for another algorithm, it is efficient. And also, we have another models, obviously, like hybrid classical quantum models that are integrating high performance computing with, with quantum models. So now let's focus on the important uh, point of this talk, which is the input output model and how to load this information. So imagine that we have some raw classical data. This data might be some coefficients of a linear system or a density function that we want to load into a quantum computer. So imagine that we load it and then we apply a known algorithm. You already know the HHL algorithm for solving this linear system of equation, or we want to compute a quantum Monte Carlo algorithm to obtain an expected value. And then obviously we we'll retrieve the information, for instance, the value of the unknowns variables or the expected value of Monte Carlo. So the point here, it is that it is not quite clear uh, that we have an efficient protocol. At least we don't have an universal one for some restricted cases. We have some specific protocols that may be um, efficient, but not in the general case and not for any uh, kind of embedding 
of classical data into quantum computers. And also when we have to retrieve the information, we are limited by the Hollett bound, which is the main constraint in terms of retrieving information. So we have to do the correct answers to our systems and obviously avoid full tomography because it will destroy any possible advantage obtained in the uh, output in the sorry in the process or input stages. So let me introduce you, broadly speaking, the three uh, the three kinds of embeddings that we may have to encode classical information into a quantum computer. So the first one will be the dynamic embedding. So basically, imagine that we have a, a matrix of classical data. For instance, a correlation matrix that you are dealing with uh, sometimes market time series. The first step it is to consider that this matrix it is Hermitian, so we can rewrite it as a Hamiltonian or calculate the associated Hamiltonian. And there are several proposals. One of them it's from Barry Sanders, which suggests uh, who suggests that uh, the matrix can be efficiently loaded in case that it is sparse. And also we have some proposals uh, by using multiple copies uh, that are from Seth Lloyd uh, and that involves that the matrix actually it is a density matrix. So either by an sparse matrix or using multiple copies and quantum channels, we can finally obtain the action of the exponential of the matrix which might be really useful if we have to apply algorithms such as the quantum phase estimation. So this will be the first kind of embedding uh, that I am studying currently through quantum channels and cross operators, uh, but this is not the topic of today. The second one, which is basis embedding. In this case, we have a, a really a byte wise translation. So if we have a string of bits, one, zero, one, we are encoding that bit string into the quantum eigen state one, zero, one. So in this way, if we have any n bit strings and a data set of n bit strings, we'll have to use n qubit. And we will codify all the strings into a uniform uh, superposition of all the eigen states that are encoding these beta strings. So this kind of encoding may be useful for parallelization in training of neural networks in quantum machine learning, but it is neither the topic of today. So let me go through the amplitude embedding technique. So let's imagine that we have a vector belonging to uh, Hilbert space and we have the two to the end components of the vector that is normalized. And we want to encode the information into the amplitude of the superposition of the two to the n basis state, the two to the n computational basis states. So there are several proposals to achieve this kind of encoding from this vector. So we have the black box methods. We also have the celebrate grover rudolph method, and we also have variational methods. So I'm going to introduce you to these three methods, and then I am going to present our two proposals. So this uh, technique, it is useful in case that we want to load uh, the, a function, we want to load a discretized version of a density function. So let me go through the black box methods. So black box methods usually require oracles. And we have no idea of how to construct this oracle. We know that it is efficient in terms of how many times we run this oracle, but we cannot ignore the complexity of constructing this oracle. So in general, this kind of algorithm requires two oracles that implements algebraic operators and constructing this uh, oracles usually takes a complexity in terms of gates that is uh, root of two to the n to achieve uh, n bit precision for staring the coefficient that we want to load. And we have both oracles 
who have to perform some operations with uh, the states. And we have even an improved version of uh, this, this uh, first version present by, by Glover, which is present by Sanders. Uh, but uh, any case, uh, this does not avoid uh, the, the complexity that uh, means to construct the Oracle. It is efficient in terms of how many times we call the Oracle and the Oracle, it is a complete black box that we don't know how to construct. So it is not useful for us. So the point here, it is that we have an overheat in terms of qubits or gates. And there's not a, a, a trivial evidence evidence that we can do it efficiently. So let me go through the through the following uh, one, which is the Grover Rudolph method. You may know uh, what this method is about. So it is the more trivial. So imagine that we have a function and we are going to iterate constructing the function adding one qubit by one qubit. So first of all, if we have only one qubit, we can split the function into two parts. So we are encoding the probability of the left half of the function into the a n state zero and the probability of the second half of the function into the probability of the state one. So basically we can do it by applying a rotation that will carry us from the zero state to a superposition of both zero and one. This would be a one. And these probabilities can be calculated as the integral in the corresponding interval. So if we repeat this process by using condition probabilities, we can increase the system and split into more partitions, obtaining uh, a more refined uh, loading of the function. So the point here, it is that in each step of the algorithm, as we increase this number of qubits, we have to calculate uh, an angle that will encode the probability of the, the, the slot of the partition that will be um, two times the arcocosine of this uh, root of the of this uh, 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 cosine of, 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 of this uh, division of, of, of integrals. So the point here, it is that uh, broadly speaking, it will lead to a complexity of two to the n uh, gates in terms of the number of qubits, because basically it's them that we want to apply a rotation only to one of the slots of the partition. We need to identify which slot it is by using control gates that are targeting the correct um, point and then apply the rotation. So basically we will have this scheme in which these gates are multi-control rotation gates that will be standing for all the possible combinations of uh, targets uh, for, for the rotations. So basically if we try to decompose it, it into two qubit gates will obtain a complexity to the end. And then we have uh, some variational algorithms so uh, the one that I'm bringing you here, it is uh, the one proposed by Krista Supal, uh, Lucy and Stephen Bergner. Uh, we use, uh, they use a, a generative quantum adversarial network to load a quantum state under the assumption made in this previous uh, work of Robert and Rudolph that claim that if the function was love concave, it is, something like this, the second logarithmic derivative of the function, it is always minor than zero, then it can be efficiently loaded. This is not completely true. Actually, it is not. So they meant the efficient in terms of calculating the angles that I have shown you before. So the point here of using this kind of variational quantum against solvers uh, so, sorry, variational quantum circuits, it is that they use uh, rotations towards the, the y axis that will generate real amplitudes, but they do not care about the sign of the amplitude. I mean, we have a degeneration in terms that these two states will encode the same 
because they are not worried about encoding information into the amplitudes rather than encoding the information into the probabilities. So they want to load the probabilities, not the amplitudes. So we have certain degeneration in terms of all the possible states that will provide us the, the, the same loading in terms of probabilities. So basically, um, this uh, work has been improved in terms of adding an ancillary cubing, qubit and measuring in the Hadamard basis. And in this way, you can also take into account the sign that you are loading. And basically, the point here, it is that they are designing variational quantum circuits that are almost everything stuck in barren plateaus that have local minima. We have tried to reproduce the results that they saw in the article, take the, the, the code from, from the GitHub, but we were not able to reproduce the results, at least with such a good expressibility and such a good performance. And it seems that it really requires that you have a really good initialization of the parameters, that it is not intuitive and also a really powerful machine because you have to iterate a lot of steps to have a, a good convergence ratio. And also the use of these general ansatz uh, does not warrant any expressibility in terms of the function that we want to load because uh, it does not include any property of the function that we want to load. So it is a general ansatz and we have no evidence of the expressibility to load a certain function. So we check all of this literature review, but we were stuck. So we decided to develop our own protocols, our own ideas and do a research. So the motivation here was this paper that I explained to you before, who was cited in many places, but there was not a clear explanation. So once during, um, uh, a seminar given by Juanjo Garcia Ripoll, he pointed out that maybe there was some something related with the efficiency of loading quantum functions related with the entangling that is going to decrease exponentially, but he had not researched it deeply. So our motivation was to study the 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 value of these angles to check whether we could simplify somehow the Grover and Rudolph algorithm. So we calculated these algorithms for loading blocks of seven, seven eight, and nine qubits for different distribution, different probability distribution, the, 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 the initial condition of a partial differential equation, the normal distribution, the beta distribution, the gamma distribution, and we realized that there were too many angles that were very similar. So the main idea that we came up, it is let's cluster them. So as you can see, even in the normal that seems that it is not similar, they are quite similar. So in every of these distribution, it seems that a lot of angles are quite similar. So. That was the, the motivation uh, to look for a mathematical statement. So the point here, it is that how can we characterize that the angles are close enough from any property of the function that we want to load? So the point here was that two angles were close enough if we could somehow control the maximum value of the second logarithm derivative of the function that we wanted to load. So basically, if we can bound the second logarithm derivative of the function, we will see how this difference between angles can be reduced to zero. So then we can uh, have certain error and cluster the, the angles and approximate the encoding. So basically we can uh, assume that any two angles uh, by using the triangular inequality are split, uh, are, at most, are, are, are distant at most 
this quantity when delta k, it is the size of the grid that we are taking in the partition with um, uh, seven, eight, nine qubits. And eta is a constant that bounds, that upper bounds our function. So this is the first idea. We have that the angles can be close enough if the function is smooth. So this will enable us to cluster all the multi control rotations and to simplify all the angles using only one. So this uniform control rotation gate can be reduced into just one single qubit rotation. So in this way, from a certain value of, uh, of qubits, let's say k0 plus one, we can assume that we have already loaded the main landscape of the function and that then we can cluster the angles and approximate this loading of the Grover and Rudolph by this other circuit. So here we have a complexity two to the n while we reduce the complexity by having certain infidelity, certain error. So the point here is, okay, let's reduce the depth of the circuit by clustering the angles, but what is going to happen with the fidelity? So basically we can find this expression for the fidelity that is lower bounded by this product of cosines. So we explore this and basically for the combinations of the upper bounds for the functions and infidelities, we obtain that the minimum number of terms to achieve such fidelity, it is usually not too large. So for instance, if you want a fidelity of 0 0.99 and you have your uh, function bounded by 10, from the six qubit, you can ignore the rest of the blocks and cluster the angles. So this was a result and this what this was stated in this theory. So basically, first we have that we have a target function, the exact function that we will load in case that we will be using the Grover and Rudolph algorithm. And then we have a theorem. That theorem states a necessary condition, which is, is that our function has to be upper bounded in terms of the second logarithmic derivative. And then we can load an approximation of the function. We are loading an approximate amplitude encoding. And therefore we have certain infidelity in our loading process, but we can considerably reduce the complexity just considering the minimum number of qubits that we need to achieve certain accuracy. And this trade off between the minimum number of qubits from which we are truncating our number of terms uh, and the error, the infidelity is given by this formula. So basically we can control the number of qubits that we use in terms of the fidelity that we want to achieve. And notice that if we make n tend to infinity, this will remain independent of, asymptotically independent of the number of qubits. So this is our first protocol. We have used it to load normal distributions. And basically we have explored the limits for which uh, this uh, second logarithmic derivative is bounded. And we find that the second logarithmic derivative of, of the normal function, it is a constant, which is uh, two out of sigma square with sigma square is the volatility. And basically we have tried to load different uh, normals depending on the, the volatility. And this is, will be the limit uh, for the theorem uh, in which we have the, the, the bound. And these are the results. Despite it seems that the plot are not very good, you can appreciate how the fidelity it is at most, at least 0 0.999 in the worst of the cases. So this was uh, our first uh, attempt and we achieved this incredible results by using the number of two qubit gates needed from the Grover and Rudolph algorithm to our algorithm to 1.18% uh, of the total number of qubits and achieving these uh, fidelities that as I say, are quite good. 
So this was our first protocol, but was quite limited because we needed the function to be a per bounded. Uh, so the first step was to generalize it. So as you can see, we have supposed that it is upper bounded. Hence, if it is upper bound uh, as the size of the partition tends to zero, it the, the, the total result will tend to zero. But what if we have a second logarithmic derivative, which tends to infinity? It is we have a singularity, but the singularity grows slower that uh, than the, the, the size of the partition tending to zero. So in this case, if this singularity is growing slower that uh, this decreases, we can also apply our theorem. So we look for uh, this theorem because uh, basically we could expand it and we can just release one angle for the singularity and assume that the rest of the angles in the interval can be clusterized in this way. And basically we could uh, load some functions as this, which has a, a singularity in the second uh, logarithm derivative, uh, but it grows uh, uh, slower uh, the size of the partition that will grow like one uh, out of two power n. Uh, so here we could uh, considerably reduce the number of gates and obtain a, a height fidelity. So it is it is a good generalization for for the conditions of the of the theorem, but it is still limited to many function that has a, a second logarithmic derivative which is not bounded. So what will happen for these cases? So for these cases we are proposing a variational protocol. So basically, let's imagine all the possible singularities that you may have uh, when uh, calculating the second logarithmic derivative of a function. So imagine we have uh, an asymptotic behavior in zero. We also have zeros that will lead to, to a second derivative. All, all the possibilities of having zeros of the function and all the possible asymptotic behaviors so the point here was, okay, imagine that we want to load this function, which is not even a uh, real value. Well, well isn't it not positive real value? Uh, and we want to apply something similar to the protocol of Grover and Rudolph. So the point here, it is that, okay, let's imagine that we can achieve the main landscape of the function just by clustering the angles that are away from the tricky points and just remain the angles that are close to the singularities and zeros. So in this case, we'll have the, the first block that we will remain with all the angles as in Grover and Rudolph, the first, our first approach to Grover and Rudolph that we only truncate from a certain value. And then from a certain value, we will assume that we can cluster the angles. Obviously we cannot cluster all the angles, but imagine that if this is our function, we can cluster the ones of violet here. Um, we can cluster this angle together with this three and with this three and with this two. So we will have a clusterization for these intervals and we will remain angles for, for the points that are given some problems from the second logarithmic derivatives that will be this, 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 and also this. So basically that we will have, it is that in terms of the circuit, we will be clusterizing uh, this, this points by, just by using only one interval and leaving the points uh, corresponding to the leaving the points corresponding to the singularities as really targeted points and leaving the general rotation corresponding to all the violet clusterized intervals like a, an additional degree of freedoms. So in this way, we can achieve a considerable reduction in terms of the number of gates needed to load functions. 
So we do not have a mathematical uh, evidence, we don't have a theory, but we have checked how this uh, variational proposal works with some examples. So basically the proposal, it is, okay, let's have uh, the Grover and Rudolph circuit with some clustering uh, of the angles, except for the control at gates that are corresponding to zeros or singular points in the second logarithmic derivative. And we will have two hyperparameters for this variational quantum circuit. The variational quantum circuit will include, and we will include a hyperparameter that will be the minimum number of qubits that we have to begin the clusterization. That will be one hyperparameter of the variational quantum circuit. And the second one is the number of angles that remain unclustered around the singularities. In this example, I only left one angle or two per singularities, but in general, we could increase the number of angles and cluster per singularity. So in this way, the total number of gates that we will be using, it is this, which is exponential with uh, the hyperparameter corresponding to the uh, and cluster blocks. So basically, we'll have this ANSAT and we initialize the parameters with some angles that are close to the values that we will obtain with Grover and Rudolph. It is, we have an approximate initial value for these angles because we may cal calculate which will be the initial value for the Grover and Rudolph algorithm, despite it is negative and, and all the, the stuffs, but we can initialize this, this uh, angle somehow with uh, the previous experience of the Grover and Rudolph algorithm. And then we will just uh, compute uh, a cost function, uh, a simple cost function with, with a gradient descent. And, and then when, whenever we have uh, uh, fidelity enough or we have a maximum number of steps or whatever. We have not gone too far with uh, uh, a more uh, fine tuning of all the possibilities for the training process. We only wanted to prove that it worked. So the first example that we tried to load was the sign. So in this case, just to no, do not leverage from uh, uh, symmet for, for to do not leverage uh, the the symmetry of of the sine function and to have both positive and negative uh, values, we define the sine function in the interval zero three out of two pi times pi. So it has two zeros in zero and pi. And uh, in this case, we loaded it by using five qubits. We define this tolerance for the error, the learning rate one point five the minimum number of uh, qubits to cluster as to, and we uh, defining the number of uh, parameter bit per each uh, angle as one, two, three, and k with k, the number of qubits corresponding uh, to the block. So basically uh, the, the training was quite fast, uh, obtaining a loss function really close to zero with a really, a really low number of steps and a fidelity really close to one. So as we increase the number of parameters, and this will be for one, for two, for three, and for K, we can appreciate how we can efficiently load this sine function. So this worked well. And another example, uh, sorry, before I'm, I'm giving you this, uh, this results. So basically, uh, depending on the number of qubits that we wanted to load, the fidelity, we could uh, have this, this logarithm of the angle. So basically you can observe the trade-off between the number of qubits that we, you want to use, the fidelity that you have, want to achieve, and the logarithm of the number of angles that you have to use. So basically if we had um, nine qubits, for instance, we'll have two to the n, two to the nine, um, gates in the in the Grover and Rudolph proposal, and you can appreciate 
and that with a considerable reduction, we can uh, achieve a really high fidelity. And just to provide you a second example, uh, we were really interested in loading the, the black soul's uh, function because it is the initial condition for a partial differential equation. Uh, so basically we loaded this function by using this variational quantum circuit uh, for five uh, qubit achieving a really high fidelity results that prove that we could efficiently load uh, this function. So depending on the number of hyperparameters related with the uncluster angles, we could achieve uh, different results for the fidelity. And this will be the, the, the number of angles that we are making use of uh, in comparison with the total number of angles if we were using uh, Grover and Rudolph algorithm. So just to illustrate you uh, how uh, this uh, initialization of, of the protocol improves, in this case, for, for this training of the uh, black soul distribution, the, the training process, uh, we can appreciate how if we initialize the angles with uh, the ones that we will be uh, obtaining by using the Grover and Rudolph algorithm, we have that, that uh, in terms of the number of steps at the infidelity, we achieve a really accurate training with a really low number of steps. While if we initialize random values for the angles with values from zero to, to two pi, we will be mostly stuck in what seems to be a local minima here. So in all of these trainings for a really large number of qubits, we have observed that the initialization with the Grover and Rudolph parameter, it is really an efficient way to avoid problems uh, that are usually associated to variational quantum circuits, such as uh, um, uh, the barring plateaus and the local minima. Uh, so this, it seems that we are not tackling uh, this in our case. So basically one, what I would like uh, you to take home regarding uh, this variational protocol, it is that it is efficiently because it reduces the gates complexity by clustering uh, the gates that are corresponding to a smooth, uh, a smooth intervals of the function while remaining unclustered the, the points that present certain singularities. So we are crea creating a really tailored variational quantum circuit. We are not giving a general proposal of variation quantum circuit of entangling gates and single qubit rotations. We are providing an adapt uh, variational quantum circuit to capture the landscape of the function that we want to load including the, the key points that are the zeros and singularities. Also, because it is inspired in the global and Rudolf algorithm, it is inspired by this, this algorithm, we have an easy training process by initializing the, the value of the angles with uh, the ones obtained by Grover and Rudolf methods, which avoid us uh, to, to have these issues of parent plateaus and local minima. And its expressibility, it, uh, the, the possible improvements and modification of our operational quantum circuit, it is straightforwardly related with the landscape of the function. So we have an intuition of what we are proposing as an answer and the hyperparameters that we are adding to our circuit. So in case that we have to achieve a more accurate description of the function, we only have to increase the hyperparameters in, in the points that are having a more tricky behavior, while in the other case, if we have a general answer and we increase the, the number of, of layers that we have in our variational answer, we are not guaranteeing that it is going to improve the way that we are capturing, uh, that we are encoding our function. So just to give you a, an outlook of all this work, we have two algorithms. The first one, which reduce the complexity um, from two to the n to two to the k zero, with uh, this trade-off between error and clustering. 
and this result is asymptotically independent of the number of qubits, but it assumes a certain infidelity. And we have stated this result mathematically with a theorem and a formal demonstration. And we have been able to generalize this protocol, this uh, statement of the theorem for functions that are containing some kind of singularities. And we have some promising results for, for this um, generalization. And finally, because we aimed at loading any real value quantum function, we have proposed an ANSAT that is inspired by our first result of clustering the angles. And we have benchmarked it for a family of functions that contain singularities that have certain importance, such as the black souls for solving the partial differential equation or the sine function or any other. We have also tried with normal and not normal functions. So in general, any known and famous density function can be efficiently loaded, loaded with any of our, our protocols. So basically the next steps uh, of, this, uh, of this work are, first of all, to generalize the proof of the theorem to provide an analytic condition to guarantee the efficient loading for a larger family of function for, uh, based on, on the results that the variational model is providing us. And also we would like to benchmark this protocol on real quantum hardware because all of these are simulations and we have not tested in, in any quantum device. So it is only a theoretical proposal and we have tried to, to load it into the, the IBM um, uh, quantum computers, uh, but it seems that we still need to find which is the optimal gate uh, decomposition, but uh, we also need to improve the, the error mitigation techniques in order to achieve a better, a better loading. So this has been everything. So thank you for your attention and for your time. And if you have any question, I will really press to, to answer. Yep, Javi, we have one question, but well, firstly, first of all, really thank you very much for this. I think it's quite, quite interesting. In fact, I probably will use some of your protocol for my following quantum machine learning methods because it's very interesting how to, I mean, from what I understood, it's very important to detect barrier and plateaus, right? Because I am currently working on that. The fact is that sometimes you cannot neglect that, right? This is a question for me, then we have one more question in the chat. But as of now for you, like, is there any possibility to, to neglect barrier and plateaus when you load this state or in the binational circuits? Well, um, as far as we could check, uh, we cannot describe exactly that there is a barren plateau because we have not tested it uh, a really large number of times and for our wide range of functions uh, that present um, some strange behaviors. So what we have observed it is that um, if we pick um, some uh, initial conditions, then the the converge the ra the ratio convergence of our protocol it is better than general random choice of the initial parameters. So we don't have an evidence. It is only numerical evidence and simulation evidence. And maybe if we enlarge uh, our mm, target functions and we uh, have more difficult challenges, uh, it results that the results were not completely uh, were not completely true. So we, we so far we have a good evidence that uh, this training can be achieved efficiently for a wide range of functions, but I cannot ensure that uh, we can neglect because in this case, this variational quantum circuit, first of all, it is adapted to the function that we want to load. And because it is adapted, we know a good initial value for the, the angle. So in general, for any variational quantum circuit, I wouldn't know if it is true or not. Perfect. It makes absolutely sense. Uh, Javier, and it is a very complicated problem. So perfect. No, thank you very much.
Okay, that's all from my side. I would say that, yeah, because I was very interesting, sorry, interesting on your talk. Um, we have one question from Mario Ponce. Uh, okay, well, we have two questions. The first one is, so the three types of embedding, dynamic basis amplitude, are equivalent in terms of data loading capabilities? I'll say that in general, not. Uh, because uh, the kind of uh, process that you have to apply, uh, it's different. So, for instance, uh, when you have to to apply the HHL algorithm, uh, you have to to use two uh, embedding protocols. Because for the independent terms, uh, you need to uh, perform an amplitude embedding, an amplitude encoding of the independent, the independent terms, and for the matrix of the coefficients. Uh, that you need to perform a quantum physics estimation, you need the, the dynamic embedding that is suggested by by Lloyd by using multiple copies copies of the of the matrix. So in general, the purpose of each one is different, are are not in general equivalent. Uh, it may be that for some cases it may be equivalent, but in the general case, the purpose uh, and the the complexity of each method, it's, it's different. And any of them exploits a different property of, of quantum mechanics. Thank you, Javi. And another question that Mario Ponce also has is, can you repeat what was the smart initial condition for the variation algorithm? Well, in, in this case, for instance, uh, the Grover and Rudolph algorithm, uh, it, is, it can be applied for any real valium function. So, for instance, for the black holes, uh, we could just calculate the angles because the angles are just a coefficient of two integrals. So you can calculate both integrals and calculate the angles. We have you have no problem because in this case both integrals are, are positive, and you have not uh, you have not a chain of sign. So you could apply the the Grover and Rudolph protocol. So in, in this case, for instance, if we have uh, n qubits, we'll have 32 angles, and you can calculate which will be the angle corresponding to this first point and the one corresponding to the last one. So the idea is that if you are just allowing one angle for all of these points in the middle and one angle for its extreme point, you can use the ones that you will obtain by using Robert and Rudolph, uh, for for the two streams and for the one in the middle, for instance, an average of of the angles that you have here in the middle. But the point is that you can you can calculate which will be the angles from Grover and Google. Thank you, Javier. In the chat, are telling me uh, if you could please uh, share your email in the chat. And I think Jose Maria Miguel, could you write down the name of your YouTube channel? It will be uploaded in the in the YouTube channel of the master of the master of quantum technologies. Uh, all the links will be sent to all of you once they are published, uh, uploaded. That it will be probably next week, okay? But everything will be shared uh, for all of you that have registered to the session. Okay, I think we are done. Okay, if they, uh, that's it, is there any further question that anyone would like to ask? Three, two, one, okay. So I think that we are done. Again, Javi, it's a really great pleasure to have you here. It has been an amazing talk. In fact, probably I will speak to you out, out of here, but thank you very, very much for being here. And it has been a great pleasure to be here with you. Thank you.